So, so let's let's take a look at uh, section 4.1. Section 4.1 will have some very familiar ideas. We're going to make sure that we're we're solid on the vocabulary that we understand. Uh, you know what we're calling something that you know maybe your neighbor uses a different word for it because they had a different teacher or something like that. So, um, again, 4.1. It's on max and min values, um, and it says. Um, Maximum and minimum values are also called extreme values. Extreme values of the function. Okay, And this textbook uses this type of definition. It calls them absolute max, absolute min, and local max, local min. So I'm going to read through these and just note the, just the tiny difference between these two definitions. So we're going to look at absolute max and absolute min and then uh, very similarly for the minimums. Okay, absolute maximum value of f on d, d for the domain, uh, if f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for all x in d. So we've got this location c where we've got a maximum value. And it's, it is a maximum value. And again, we're talking about function values. If it is the largest function value, if it's greater than or equal to all of the other function values for all x in d. So on, whoops, on entire domain. It's the absolute largest. Now, if we talk about a local maximum, notice the difference here, the, the tiny little distinction. It says it's a local maximum if f of c is greater than or equal to f of x, where x is near c. Okay, So in a little local neighborhood. little no local neighborhood of C. So if we're talking about an absolute maximum, it is the absolute maximum function value, the highest function value on the entire domain. If we're talking about a local maximum, then we're just talking about in a little local area, a little local neighborhood around that particular point. Okay? And minimum, of course, is the same. Absolute minimum, the absolute lowest point of uh, lowest function value on the entire domain and local would be the lowest function value in a little neighborhood, a little local area around um, C. Okay? And then we should make sure that we're aware of this. There are times where people will use this word. They'll use the word relative in place of local, and they'll use the word global in place of absolute. Okay? So sometimes you'll hear people say, um, What's the global maximum or what's the global minimum or what's the relative max or relative min? And that's what they're talking about there. Okay, so we're just going to take a look at some pictures here and just kind of spot some things. So let's find the local, uh, abs local and absolute extreme values on the graph. Well, here's what we're going to do. Before we start talking about local or absolute, let's just go through and figure out whether we've got a max or a min. So in this little area, this is going to be a minimum. A small point on that uh, low point there. Okay, this is going to be a max. This point right here is going to be a min, and this point right here is a max. Okay, well now let's go through and let's figure out whether that we're going to call this a local min or an absolute min. Okay, is this the smallest function value on the entire domain? The domain on this one goes from one to seven. Is it the smallest function value? No, okay, so that one's got to be local, okay? Let's take this maximum right here, this high point. Is, the, is it the highest point, highest function value, largest function value of any point on that entire domain? It is, okay? So we're going to call that an absolute maximum. Okay, what about this minimum? Absolute or local? Okay, that's going to be absolute, and this one right here? Local, this end point, it's a local. In this little area around there, it's the largest function value. Now... Could I, if I wanted to, could I call that a local max right here? It, does it meet the definition? Is it the highest function value on the little local neighborhood there? Yes, it is. What would be a better description for it? Absolute. Okay. If it's an absolute maximum, clearly, in that little area, if it's the largest function value over the whole thing, clearly it would have to be the largest function value in a little area around there. Okay. So we could call it a local maximum, but, but the best description for it would be an absolute maximum. Yeah? Right. 
because you have to compare it to the ones around it. Okay. In this little local area, this is the highest point, so it's going to be a local max. Over here, even though it's the same function value, it's the smallest of all of these function values in that little neighborhood. Excellent question. Anything else? Okay, let's do the same thing here. What's this one right here? This would be absolute. Okay, if we compare this, this is going to be, whoops, absolute minimum. Comes up here. What's this one right here? Okay, local max right here. Yeah, we've already identified the absolute minimum, so this one's going to be local min. What's this guy right here? That one's going to be an absolute or global max. Here we're going to have a local min, because it's not quite as low as that, one, that first one we came across right there. And then this one's a local max. Okay? Pretty darn easy, right? Okay, so <clears throat> what I want to do with this next bit of graphing here, um, we want to look at this and we want to think about the difference between what is the extreme value, okay? So if I say what is the extreme value, what is the max, we're talking about the y-coordinate. If I say where it occurs, we're talking about the x-coordinate, okay? And then we want to look at this and we want to figure out um, even though these graphs are very similar along here, the extreme values, the maxes and mins, can depend on several things. It depends on the continuity of the function and the interval of interest. So if I take a look at this graph right here, let me blow this up just a little bit. Okay, I have no maximum on this whatsoever because this continues going up and out. Okay, so no maximum whatsoever. But this right here is an absolute minimum. The minimum value is zero. It occurs at zero. Okay, the coordinates of that point would be zero, comma zero. Okay, if I look at this right here, this is now has a restricted do domain. It's not the domain from negative infinity to infinity. It's just from looks like from zero to two. Well, this right here would be an absolute minimum, and this right here would be an absolute maximum. The absolute maximum would be four. It would occur at x equals two. Minimum would be zero. It would occur at x equals zero, okay? And both of those would be absolute max, absolute min, okay? On this one right here, notice the difference here. The domain has now changed, so I have an open end point here and a closed end point here. So this has an absolute max right here, but it doesn't have an absolute min, okay? Now, it does have a limit. It comes down and it gets really close to zero, okay? But it never actually equals zero, and there's no smallest point. You could say, well, how about point zero 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 one? Well, all somebody else would have to do is say, well, gosh, I can find a point where it's even closer to zero. Throw 18 zeros in there, and that would be even lower. So if you have an open end point, you don't have a function value, and therefore can't have an extreme value. Okay? So if I take a look at this last one right here, neither one of those endpoints is closed. So I don't have a max or a min. Looks a little bit weird. I mean, gosh, it goes up right here. I mean, one of those points has got to be the highest. But there is no highest function value there. There is no maximum value there. Okay? So if you have open end points, you cannot have a max or a min at that point. You've got to have a function value in order to have that. Okay? Now, if we take a look at this next one, these graphs are made up of kind of piecewise functions. Okay? So on this one right here, I've got this left end point right here. It is a closed end point, so that would be at least a local min. I come up here. It's open right here, so I don't have a max right there. And then I hop right down here. Okay, so these are both local and, better yet, absolute minimums because they are absolutely the lowest function value. Okay, it's only defined from 0 to 1. Okay, it's not defined over here or over there. The lowest function value is zero, and it occurs at two different places. So it happens to be a tie. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's take a look at this next one. So here I've got an absolute minimum, because again, I've got my domain from A to B. It's a closed endpoint, so it actually has a function value there. Then it comes up here, and it has a closed endpoint. Now, normally at a closed endpoint, we could say we have an extreme value, okay? Is there any way that is a maximum right here? 
No, because all I have to do is hop over here just a little bit, and I've got a, all these points right here that are larger, have a greater value than this one right here. But at the end point right here that would be the highest, we don't have a function value there. Okay? So there is no maximum here. Yeah. Uh, we'd have to do, uh, we could, I suppose, describe it as far as the direction goes. We'd have a, absolute, or a, a local maximum from, coming from the left. Okay, but remember, we're saying a little neighborhood around there. Okay, so if I were to say from here to here, all of these are lower, but if I include this side over here, okay, we're not, it's not like talking about a limit or a derivative or something like that. Okay, we usually don't have sides associated with those. Okay. Okay, so no maximum, and this one right here, what would we call this? Local minimum. Absolute minimum here, local minimum there. Okay, no, no relative max and no absolute max. Okay, and then if we took a look at this graph right here, and let's assume that this, this extends in both directions. So this is x cubed. Any maxes or min? None. Okay, no absolute max because it continues going up. No absolute min for the same reason it going downward. And then it doesn't have any place where we could say, ah, it kind of levels off, has a little peak here, a highest point. Okay, so no max or min on that one there. Any questions? Okay, so the next thing is something called the extreme value theorem. Okay, and this is a very short theorem, but it's very important. Um, it's on page 275, and it makes some guarantees about extreme values, and some parts of this are very important. It says, if f is continuous on a closed interval, so it has to be continuous on a closed interval, all right, then f attains an absolute maximum value and an absolute minimum value on that little interval. Now we could make it really wordy and read uh, maximum minimum value f of c, or maximum value f of c and absolute minimum value f of d for some number c and d in uh, a to b. Okay, but what it means is if you have a continuous function on a closed interval you are absolutely guaranteed that you can find an absolute max and an absolute min. Okay? Guaranteed. Okay? <clears throat> but just to emphasize, it's important. It has to be continuous on a closed interval. If you have a graph that's discontinuous on a closed interval, no guarantee. If you have a continuous graph on an open interval, no guarantee. Okay, so that hypothesis, the setup for that, that theorem is very important. It's got to be continuous on a closed interval. Ben, did you have a question? Yep, mm -hmm. yep, okay. So finding extreme values is actually pretty darn easy as we saw on those graphs, okay? But it's, it's important to notice where they occur. So we're going to flip back on this page right here. And we're going to look at this diagram right here. And we're going to notice something. I mean, we're calculus students. We know a lot about derivatives. Okay. Take a look at this right here and think about where they occur and what the derivative would be. Okay. Let's take the easy ones right here. What's the derivative right there? Derivative would be 0. Okay. F prime would equal 0. How about right here? F prime would be 0. What about right here? F prime would be 0. Okay, now what about right here? Okay, F prime would not exist. Okay, and these guys right here, the derivative in both cases happens to be positive. Okay, but it's an endpoint, and endpoints you got to be a little bit careful with. Okay, now just for the heck of it, let's come over here and look at that. Both places where the max and min occur, derivative would be 0. Okay, so if I find that the derivative is zero, it's come up and it's leveled off for just a second. It's flattened off and it's either going up, leveling off and going down, which would produce a max, or going down, leveling off, and then going back, back up, which would produce a min. Okay, so um, there's this uh, Fermat's theorem that they, that they state in the book, and it says this. If f, of x, if f has a local max or min at c, and if f prime of c exists, then f prime of c equals zero. Okay, I don't like this theorem because I think there should be one other thing. Okay, it should say on an open interval. Okay, 
should say that f is defined on a on an open integral, okay? Because do I have a local max right here? Right here. Yes, I do. Is the derivative zero? No, it's not. Okay. So I think they should include the the fact that this theorem is true if you if it's defined on an open interval. Okay. Now, just like the last test where I gave you three ways that a derivative can fail to exist at a point, okay, there are three ways that we can get an extreme value, and here's what they are. You can have an extreme value, a max or a min, where the derivative equals zero, where the derivative does not exist, and at end points. And lots of people forget to check the end point, so please don't do that. So, three places you can find an extreme value. Find where the derivative equals zero, find where the derivative doesn't exist, and endpoints. Those three places are the only times you will find a max or a min. It's got to come to a point, derivative doesn't exist, okay? Got to level off, derivative would equal zero, or check the endpoints. Yeah, you can have an extreme value at endpoints. You can have a largest function value or a lowest function value at the endpoints, regardless of what the derivative is, as long as that endpoint is in the domain. It's not an, uh, an open circle. Okay? So this textbook, textbook uses a, a definition. It, it's, it calls these critical numbers. And a critical number is an interior point, okay? a point inside the, the domain, inside the endpoints, where the derivative equals zero or where the derivative does not exist. Okay, and some books will also call these critical values. So if you hear the word critical point or critical value, what they're talking about is where the derivative doesn't exist or where it equals zero. Okay? So I'm going to do these two examples, example two and three. Yeah. Well, this one right here, okay. Yeah, and the and the derivative doesn't exist there. So it it, it does it doesn't mean there is a max or a min. It just means if there is a max or a min, it has to occur at one of those three places. Okay. So those are the places where we check. Okay. All right, so we're going to look at example one and two. This one, you should know what that looks like. That's a piece of cake, right? Parabola, vertically stretched by a factor of three. You should know where the vertex is, and we know it opens up, okay? So we can, I mean, we can visualize what this looks like, okay? But we're going to go through this one, and we're going to talk about this in, in terms of the extreme value theorem. Um, so the first thing we do is we realize that I need to find the derivative, and I need to find where the derivative doesn't exist or where it equals zero. So the first thing we'll do is let's find the derivative. Well, the derivative is derivative of the outside. That's going to be 6. Leave the inside alone. Exponent's going to be 1 times by the derivative of the inside. That's going to be 1. And then the derivative of 2 is 0. So we end up with 6 and x minus 1. Okay. Now, what I want to know is when does f prime equal 0? When does that happen? When x is equal to 1. When does f prime not exist? Never. Okay? So we don't have to worry about that. Do we have endpoints? We do. We have an endpoint of x equals 0, and we have an endpoint of x equals 3. Okay? So I have three possible locations for maxes and mins. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put them in order. So I'm going to put a 0, a 1, and a 3. So here's x, and here's f of x. I want to find the function values. So if I plug in a 0, I get 0 minus 1, negative 1 squared, that's 1, times 3, that's 3, plus 2, so I get a 5. Whoops, just put a 5. What if I plug in a 1? I get a 2. What if I plug in a 3? I get 3 minus 1 squared times 3, that's 12, 14. Okay, now, all we have to do is look at those. Okay? 
In red here, I said, does this satisfy the hypothesis of the extreme value theorem? Is it continuous? Yes. Is it defined on a closed interval? Yes. We're guaranteed a maximum, an absolute maximum, and an absolute minimum value. Okay? And all we have to do is go through and look at this. What's that one? Absolute max. Okay? And this one? Absolute min. Okay? So we're going to have an absolute min of 2 at x equals 1. Or we could call it the point 1, comma 2. And we're going to have an absolute max of 14 at x equals 3. We could call it the point 3, comma 14. So let's just think about what this looks like. 0, 5, we're about here. 1, 2, we're about right here. And 3, 14, we're about right here. Here is our, whoops, shouldn't uh, extend that. Here's our parabola. Could we name any other extreme values? Yeah, this one right here must be a relative maximum. Okay. Any questions there? I mean, so if you could have visually graphed this or just sketched it on the on your on your paper, you would have been able to pick out. Well, there's a min. And it's the absolute min. And there's a max, an absolute max, and here's a local max. Okay? Okay, but this one, you don't know what it looks like. Unless you grab the calculator and you're cheating, right? Okay. So let's take a look at this. Again, the way we're going to find possible locations for maxes and mins is we're going to find the derivative. So if I find the derivative... Let's see, this is a product. So I've got to take the first times the derivative of the second. That's going to be negative 1 over x. Plus the second, that's going to be 2 minus ln x times the derivative of the first, which is 10. So that's going to give me negative 10. Distributing through, I get plus 20 minus 10 ln x. Is that what you got? Any mistakes here? Anybody recognize this? It's on your test. Okay. So this is going to be 10 minus 10 ln x. And what do we want to know about this? We want to know where it equals 0. So let's set this equal to 0. If I set this equal to 0, I'm going to do 10 equals 10 ln x. I'm going to divide both sides by 10. So I'm going to have 1 equals ln x. Exponentiate both sides. So I get x equals e. So it equals the derivative equals 0 at x equals e. Now, is e in our little interval? Notice it is a closed interval, and it would be continuous on there. The only domain issue we'd have here would be at 0, right? Because ln isn't defined for 0 or negatives. Okay? And that is in between there. Okay? So that is an interior point on that closed interval. Okay? Now, does the derivative ever not exist? Well, it wouldn't exist when ln doesn't exist, and ln doesn't exist for 0 and negatives. Are 0 and negatives in our interval? They are not, okay? So none from that. Do I have any endpoints? I do. I've got x equals 1, and I've got x equals e squared. Now, as ugly as this problem is, I can only have a max or a min at these three locations. That's it. Nowhere else. I'm guaranteed that. So let's go ahead and let's put these in order. So I've got 1 here. That's an endpoint. I've got e about right here. And then I've got e squared about right there. And I don't know what this graph looks like. But let's figure out the function values. So if these are the x's, let's figure out the f of x's. If I plug in a 1, let's see how well this works out. If I plug in a 1, I'll change colors and I'll do the work right here. f of 1 equals 10 times 1 
2 minus the ln of 1. Let's see. ln of 1, 0. So this is 2 times 10. So this is 20. Function value at 1 is 20. Let's plug in an e. If I plug in an e, I get 10 times e, and then I get 2 minus the ln of e. And the ln of e is 1, so this is 2 minus 1, that's 1. So I get 10 times e, and e is about 2.7. Okay, So this is about 27.1-ish, somewhere around there. So what happened from this function value to this function value? Did we go up or down? We went up. Okay, so automatically this one's never going to be the absolute maximum because I've already found a point that's that's larger. Okay, and let's do the last one. This one's kind of interesting. Uh, f of e squared. That's going to be 10 times e squared, and then I'm going to have 2 uh, times 2 minus ln of e squared. And what is the ln of e squared? 2. So I have 2 minus 2, right? 2 minus 2 is 0. doesn't matter how big this is. I end up with 0 from this one right there. Okay? So, um, if I were to sketch this graph, at 1, I would have a function value of 20. At E, I would have a function value of 27.1, or 10E. Okay? And once I get to E squared, what's my function value? 0. Okay? Does the derivative ever not exist here? No. So if the derivative doesn't exist, that means I've got no cusps or corners. I've got to have nice, smooth transitions. So it's got to look something like this. Okay. So I have an absolute max right here. I have an absolute min right here. And I have a relative ma or relative min or a local min right there. And if we grab the calculator and we threw that in there just to check and see what this looks like, uh, we'll go to the y equals and I'm going to clear that off. So I'm going to put in 10x, close the parens, and then it's going to be 2 minus ln x. Close the parens again. Let's be smart about how we set this up. Um, I'm going to set up the window to go from 0 to Let's see, e squared is probably around 8-ish, 7 or 8-ish. So let's go to 10. Let's leave the scale at 1. Let's go a little bit in the negative, but we've got to go up to 27. So let's go from negative 3 all the way to 30. And uh, let's make the scale equal to 5 or something like that. And let's see the graph of this. And I'm going to hit trace. Oops, let me make a little bit larger window. Let's go to 35. And I'm going to hit trace. And I'm going to type in E. And E is above the divide, so I'm going to hit second that. Hit enter. And there it is right there. there that's the highest point on there. Okay. Okay. Any questions there? Okay. All right. Um, let's take a look at this one. This one's kind of an interesting function. It's, it's really not that complicated. Notice what the domain is. It's a closed interval. Okay. So let's find the derivative. So f prime of x on this one is going to be, well, let's see. I'd bring down the exponent. Reduce the exponent by 1, so that's going to be negative 3 fifths. So if I were to write this, I would write a 2 on the top, a 5, and then I'd write the fifth root of x cubed. We talked about the fact that it's continuous, or sorry, we talked about the fact that it's uh, on a closed interval. Is it continuous? Can you plug in anything you want? Here, on the original function. On the original function, you can. So this is a continuous function. Okay, it's a continuous function on a closed interval. So we're guaranteed an absolute max and an absolute min. Okay, here's the derivative. Okay, does the derivative ever equal zero? 
does that ever equal zero? Nope. The only part that could make a fraction equal to zero is the numerator. The numerator doesn't have a, a variable in it, so there are no points where, where it equals zero, where the derivative equals zero, where it flattens off. Does the derivative not exist? Yes. At x equals zero. At x equals zero, the derivative doesn't exist. Now think about this. If I have a continuous function and the derivative doesn't exist at a point, that narrows it down considerably. It can't be a point of discontinuity because we already know it's continuous. So where this function doesn't have a derivative is either cusp or corner or or a vertical tangent. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for this to come to a point, some sort of point, or have a vertical tangent. We just need to figure out what it is. Okay? Um, and does it have endpoints? Yes, it does. X equals negative 1 and X equals 32. So these points right here that I'm circling right now, those are the only locations that we could possibly have a max or a min. So let's, let's check and see what we've got here. So I'm going to make a little, uh, let's see, we're only going from negative 1 okay, to 32. So I'm going to do this. Let's plug in the first one. Let's plug in a negative 1. And let's figure out what the function value is. If I plug in a negative 1, so that is, if I rewrite this in a little bit easier format, this is the fifth root of whatever I'm plugging in, and then I square it. So I'm going to plug in a negative 1. The fifth root of negative 1 is negative 1, and I square that, I get positive 1. Okay? Okay. So 1, comma, whoops, negative 1, comma 1. The next one I'm going to plug in is a 0, because I could have an extreme value there. So if I plug in a 0, I get 0 squared, which is 0. Okay, so I've got that point 0, 0. Now plug in a 32. Fifth root of 32, 2. Square that. 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? So if I go all the way over here to 32, I've got a function value of 4. So 32 comma 4. Now, what is this right here? Absolute max. What is this? Absolute min. And what is this? Local max. Now, what does it look like? What do you think we have here? It does. Okay? Remember, this is a fifth root graph. Fifth roots graph, they're nice, nicely behaved. They're nice and smooth. Okay, But what happens here is I have what looks like a fifth root graph, and then what happens when I square it? This part that used to go down below like this, squaring it, flips it over here. What do I have there? I have a cusp. All right? Any questions there? You can put the square underneath, yeah. This is a little better because then you're taking a fifth root of a smaller number. Usually works out a little easier. Okay, um, let's go ahead and do, you have, you, you've got some problems on the, on the assignment that are have instructions like this. It says, find the critical points, places where the derivative doesn't exist or where it equals zero, and then use your graphing calculator to determine whether the critical point corresponds to a max or a min or neither, okay? Um, it is possible that the derivative equals zero, and it just kind of flattens off for a second, kind of like x cubed, and we don't have a max or a min, okay? It wouldn't be a highest point, okay? So we've got to be a little bit careful with that. Now, all we have to do is find the critical points here. We don't actually have to graph it or do anything like that or plug function values in or plug values in to get function values. Um, we're just going to use the calculator, okay? Now, would this be a good test question? No, because you can't use your calculator, okay? Much better to be able to do those problems that we did a second ago. Okay, so if I find the derivative here, I have 3x squared minus 12. Um, I want to know when this equals 0, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to factor that. So f of x, or f prime of x, could also be written as 3x minus 2 and x plus 2. So I want to know this. I want to know where the derivative equals 0. I want to know where the derivative doesn't exist. And I want to know about endpoints, because those are my possible locations for extreme values. Does it ever equal 0? 
Yeah, at, at 2 and at negative 2, at those two locations. Does it ever fail to exist? None. No points I need to check there. And any endpoints? Okay, not the way they described this, so none there. So the only possible places I could have a max or a min are at plus and minus 2. So I'm going to grab the calculator. We're literally just going to type this in. So I've got an x cubed minus a 12x minus a 5. Make sure we typed it in there correctly. Now, I'm going to hit zoom 6, just the standard window. Whoops. There we go, zoom 6. Not quite big enough, so let's, uh, let's change the window just a little bit. Uh, probably no, don't need to go quite as wide, so maybe we can go negative 5 to positive 5. And we'll go uh, negative, let's guess negative 25 to positive 25. Hopefully that will give us a decent looking graph. Absolute local? Local max at negative 2. Local min at positive 2. Again, you could use your calculator to find out what they are. Local max of 11, it occurs at negative 2. And if I type in a 2, local min of negative 21 at positive 2. Any questions there? Okay, I'm going to grab this and we'll put it there. All right, so we've got a couple of uh, problems left here. I think we can get these done. So on example six, it says, for the following example, find the extreme values of the function and where they occur. To do this, we use the derivative to find the critical points when we compare the function values, and then we compare the function values at those points. I only want you to use a calculator to confirm your answers. You might be able to maybe guess roughly what this would look like. I mean, think about what squaring would do to the sine curve on that little interval. You might be able to guess. Okay, We'll take a look when we're done. But again, what we need here is we need the derivative. So I'm going to find y prime. y prime in this case is 2 sine x. Derivative of the outside left the inside alone times the derivative of the inside. You'll notice here what? It is a double angle and you could use a double angle if you wanted to. You'll notice that, I mean, we just gloss over the fact that we found a derivative. In the last chapter, it was all about finding derivatives. We're now just writing them down and moving on. We're talking about a different idea here. What can you do with this derivative? What do you know about the graph based on this derivative? So um, we want to check where y prime is equal to 0. And we want to check where y prime does not exist. Is there any place where it doesn't exist? Nope. And we want to check the endpoints. Now, is an endpoint, is that a critical point? Is an endpoint a critical point? It's not. Endpoints are not critical points. You can have maxes and mins at endpoints, but they are not critical points. By definition, they're either it's where the derivative equals zero or where the derivative doesn't exist. So the only the only critical points that we're gonna have are when whoops. When 2 sine x cosine x is equal to 0. Well, if you'll remember from trig, the way we solve this is we say, well, we set sine of x equal to 0, and we set the cosine of x equal to 0. But remember, we're only interested on this little interval right here. So you could solve this using the unit circle. You could solve this on your calculator. Um, I find this the easiest thing to do. That's what sine looks like, right? This is negative pi halves, this is pi halves. Where does it equal zero? Only right here, okay? So only at x equals zero, okay? And cosine looks like this. On... This, this one will. This one will. They're coming, not done. I'm, I'm taking each separate factor and finding when each separate factor will equal zero. Because 2 isn't going to make the whole thing equal to 0, so we, so we set sine of x and cosine of x equal to 0. Okay, Cosine of x would equal 0 at negative pi halves and at pi halves, which happen to be endpoints. So we were going to check those anyway. So what are the critical values? 0 
and plus and minus pi halves. Not because they're endpoints, but because the derivative equals zero there. Okay? And for those of you that notice that y prime is equal to the cosine of 2x, cosine of 2x is equal to zero at negative pi halves, zero and pi halves, if you wanted to check it that way. Okay? All right, so let's do the same thing we did before. Okay, I'm interested from negative pi halves to pi halves. Let's plug these in. Plug in negative pi halves into the original function. What is the sine of negative pi halves? All right, let's think about the unit circle here. It's the y coordinate right there. It's negative 1. Square that I get, positive 1. So negative pi halves, comma, 1 is the value there. Let's see what happens. Maybe it goes up, maybe it go, goes down. Let's plug in a 0. Sine of 0 is y coordinate 0 radians. So that would be 0. Square that, I get 0. So this point is 0, comma, 0. Okay, so clearly this is some sort of max. Okay, maybe it goes down like this. Or can't we take a guess here? What happens when you square something? It's positive. Okay, so this is pi halves, comma, 1. So this graph does this. Okay, watch. How do I know it doesn't do this? The, the derivative exists and it equals zero. If it equals zero, that means it levels off, right? Okay. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yep. Double angle for sign. Sorry about that. Need to practice my trick. Or paying attention on a Monday morning after a fun long weekend. Okay. Any questions there? Max or mins are easy to find here, right? Okay. Let's take a look at the last one. The last one, and you've got a few problems like this, and this shows a good conceptual understanding of what we're talking about. How does the derivative relate to the graph? What does it mean? What does it tell us? So sketch a graph of a function that meets the following criteria. So sometimes on these open-ended questions, you're like, well, what's the answer? Well, there's a billion different answers because it just depends on how you want to draw it. But it does have to meet these criteria. Notice that it's continuous, one solid piece, one connected piece from end to end, okay? From 1 to 5, with an absolute minimum at 1. What does that tell us? Yeah, wherever we start here, that's got to be the lowest point, okay? So if I'm starting at 1, let's say I start right here. That's got to be the lowest point, okay? It's got to have a maximum at 2. Now, did it say it had to have a derivative everywhere? No, so we, we could do this, couldn't we? This, this is, these are the x values. x equals 1 to x equals 5. It says at. At means where. And where is x? Where is x? Okay. Mm -mm. Nope. Okay, and okay, so so let's let's think about this. What if this was the y value? So it's got a minimum. It's got a minimum value of one. Yeah. How big would your stinking graph paper have to be if you were going to make this? You could put it anywhere you want. Okay. If it just said the minimum y value is one, you could your friend could put it out at negative four billion if they wanted to. Okay, that's why that whole where something occurs and what is going on there. Those are two different questions. Where is an x? We always locate things according to its x-coordinate. So if I say where is the maximum, don't tell me the maximum is 17. Tell me the maximum is 17 at 2 or something like that. Okay. Where is a question about the x? So at 1, it has a minimum. That's got to be the lowest point. Absolute maximum at 2, so by the time we get to 2, that's got to be its maximum. It didn't say it had to have a derivative there, okay? And it has a local min 
at three. Would that work? Yeah. Absolute minimum, absolute maximum. It's got a local minimum here. Could we have done something like this? Whoops. Could we have done something like that? No, because it goes up too high. Could we have done this? Maybe that. Could we have done this? Yes. Okay. Lots of different options there. Got it? Okay. Last one. Last one says, and we might need to think about this for just a second, has a domain of 1 to 5. So those are the x coordinates. That's telling us where our little window is going to be in the x direction. It says it has an absolute minimum, but no absolute maximum. An absolute minimum, but no absolute maximum. Do this. How do I make sure it has no absolute maximum? Uh, I could do I could do a vertical asymptote like this at five. I could. Whoops! It was it was. Uh, in fact, that's the only way because I can't. Uh, I've got to make a vertical asymptote there, don't I? Uh, what's the problem with... Oh, you know what? Could we do a hole? Why can we do a hole? Because it doesn't say it's got to be continuous. Okay? So we could do a hole. We could do a vertical asymptote. Anything like that would be fine. Okay? Oh, no. No, you couldn't do... Oh, we could fix this, though. What could we do? Put a point somewhere else. Yeah. Lots of things we could do with that. Okay. All right. Any questions? Okay. We're going to speed through 4.2 tomorrow, and then we're going to spend uh, two days on 4.3. So by the end of the week, we're going to cover uh, 4.1, 4.2, and 4.3. Okay. So that's it for 4.1. 4, You've already got the notes for 4.2. I just did that to save space, uh, save paper. Okay. All right. Have a great day.